Released in 2018 by Acid Wizard Studios, Darkwood is a survival horror game that follows an unnamed man as he tries to escape the eponymous forest. As he does his best to survive in the desolate environments and against the terrifying monsters, he comes across lore items and has conversations with NPCs that unveil the background of the world, revealing things like where the Darkwood came from, what led to the creation of all the creatures that live in it, and how the people in the forest have lived here for so long. However, in order to see all these details of the game's story, players are required to play through it at least twice, as depending on their choices, certain quest lines, events, and even lore items aren't available for them to see. This is before considering all the time it takes to fully explore the game to see everything and then put it all together afterwards. Well, in an effort to see the lore of the game along with the many different paths the protagonist can take in his journey, Let's go ahead and go through the information of the game and present it here so we can see the full story of Darkwood. Obviously, spoilers are ahead, so if you don't want to be spoiled, then, you know, don't watch this. In fact, I'd recommend you play through the game first, as the story experience as offered by the game is going to be better than just listening to me narrate over everything, because that's the way the creators originally intended it to be experienced. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get started. It all started in the year 1975 in a rural, forested area somewhere in the countryside of Poland. Here, the people of the land lived out ordinary lives. They farmed the land, they reared livestock, and they raised their families. Although it wasn't luxurious living and there were plenty of times that people would quarrel with each other, for the most part it was rather peaceful, and no matter how much people seemed to despise each other, they would always band together to get through tough times. But that all changed when, in August of 1975, a meteor streaked across the sky and crashed in the forest near their villages. While this was indeed a notable event, no one had any idea how much change it would usher in. In the years following the impact, the area surrounding the crater began to undergo changes. It started with odd-looking mushrooms that began to sprout up everywhere in the woods, taking over the other flora. Then the trees began to grow at an exponential rate, expanding the borders of the forest and making it incredibly thick. It wasn't just the plant life that was changing. Rashes and growths appeared on the skin of the people that lived in the forest along with their livestock, a manifestation of a strange new plague striking the area. Upon hearing the news of what was happening, the government of the country came in and began to research the forest, an area that came to be known as the Darkwood, to try and understand this phenomenon. They soon found that, as the forest was expanding, it was growing in a recognizable honeycomb pattern, with cells ranging from a few dozen to a few hundred square kilometers across. As they monitored the growth of the woods, they noticed that the larger cells were often dividing into the smaller ones, making it seem likely that eventually the whole of the darkwood would be made up of these smaller cells. The walls of these cells, made up of the tangled mass of trees, were remarkably consistent throughout the honeycomb, always being about 50 meters thick. While the consistency was notable, it was the density of those trees that was especially significant. At most, there were 10 centimeters between the trunks, meaning passage through them was difficult if not outright impossible. Getting through the trees was made even more impossible by their uncanny ability to quickly heal damage done to them, making efforts to chop through them pointless. This incredible healing ability seemed to be triggered by a white, gooey substance that oozed from the tree at the point it was damaged. When this substance was analyzed, the researchers found that the trees that leaked it weren't trees at all, but replicas of them. Apparently, the white substance was some sort of shape-shifting material that would copy things it came in contact with. The prevalence of these replicated trees in the darkwood was so great that some researchers estimated they made up 85% of it. Further investigations discovered that the white substance was being pumped through the forest through huge braids of roots that ran under the whole thing. Roots that all pointed back to the site of the meteor impact from 1975. Evidently, whatever was happening in the forest was linked to that impact event. As the researchers learned about the nature of the trees at the Darkwood, they also studied the unique plague that was afflicting the local populace. As the disease progressed, the growths would continue to spread over the body of the patient. As a result, it was common for their physical features to become twisted and warped, which gave them disturbing visages. 
patients also began to experience vivid auditory and visual hallucinations, the most common being a voice that called to them, telling them to go deeper into the forest. The voice was always someone close to the patient, making its alluring call all the more enticing to them. People that couldn't resist the call and dove into the woods to chase after it were quite often never seen again. However, occasionally there were times when someone that had been lost to the dark wood would be seen amongst the trees, but it was evident from their appearance and behavior that they were not who they once were. They had removed their clothes, covered themselves in mud, and given themselves unsettling horns made of bundles of sticks. They built strange shrines or carved weird symbols on the ground of the woods and revered them as if they were trying to please some sort of god or entity. And if people got too close to them, they became aggressive, attacking their perceived interloper with makeshift weapons. Whether their transformation was some sort of biological effect on the brain from the plague, or a mental breakdown triggered by the stresses of living in the wild and being tormented by the voice was never clear. But what was clear was that these people were no longer the civilized folk they had once been. They were now savages of the wood, and were a big danger to the government and the local populace. However, not everyone infected with the plague devolved into one of these savages. Some people resisted the call of the wood and stayed in their homes and villages. But no matter if they kept their senses or became a savage, the eventual fate of someone infected by the plague was incredibly horrific. As the growths continued to spread and the patient's bodies were further mutated, they began to suffer from painful aches, particularly of the head. Eventually, this pain became so debilitating that the person was rendered immobile from it and would lie in misery until they wasted away. But there was something else that could happen to them too. Once they reached this late stage of infection, weird lacerations would appear down the vertical midline of their body, beginning at the top of their head. If, once these manifested, the infected person received a sufficient bit of stimuli, their lacerations would rupture and the person would split in half along this laceration. They wouldn't die though. Instead, the split in their body became a toothy maw and they would viciously attack anybody nearby, trying to rip them to shreds with their monstrous teeth. These chompers, as they became known as, were relentless in their pursuit of their prey, chasing them down even after sustaining damage that would kill anything else in the world. Once it appeared, there were only two ways to deal with a chomper. One was by putting enough distance or obstacles between it and yourself to escape, or to attack it until it finally died. Despite the efforts of local doctors to manage this plague, including, but not limited to, separating the sick and healthy, nothing they ever did worked, meaning anybody infected by it was doomed to either disappear into the woods, become a savage, become a chomper, or die from the disease. When these efforts failed, the government stepped in and took some drastic steps to try and quell the infection by burning down villages and euthanizing the infected that tried to escape. But even with these efforts, the plague raged on. The only thing that did seem to work was a series of blockades that the government set up which prevented the local populace from leaving the Darkwood, as well as prevented anyone from outside the forest from entering. They took this a step further by banning the researchers that were sent into the forest from coming into contact with the local populace, so as to minimize their chances of infection. This made their forays into the forest sort of like secret missions, where they hid amongst the trees. They even built several secret hideouts throughout the wood where they could safely stay while they performed their work. Of course, being cut off from the rest of the world didn't sit too well with those trapped in the dark wood, and although the researchers tried their best to remain hidden, there were villagers that caught glimpses of them flitting through the trees. Villagers who grew to resent the outsiders that were allowed to leave the forest as they wished, a luxury that they were not allowed to have. Merely restricting contact with those that may be sick wasn't enough, however, as people were still falling ill to the plague even with minimal to no contact. Although there wasn't any documentation on the exact vector of infection of the plague, the government was seemingly able to deduce that it was in the air, likely through spores expelled by the replicated flora of the forest. Thus, it ordered all of its researchers to wear hazmat suits fit with oxygen tanks to prevent their infection. Although these suits weren't perfect and there were still times that researchers would disappear in the woods, they helped give their workers a bit of protection as they did their work in the forest, and they needed all the help they could get as the woods were still an incredibly dangerous place. 
On top of the violent savages and terrifying chompers, and the very air itself being dangerous, there was still the local wildlife to contend with, some of which had been mutated by the plague. There were also other monstrous beings that seemed to walk straight out of people's nightmares. There were large reptilians with vaguely human features that lurked in the swamps. There were mushroom men that hid in the foliage and blew up whenever unsuspecting victims got too close. There were bird-human hybrids called banshees that let out a horrible screech when looked at, unleashing a swarm of their children to attack whoever saw them, as well as many others. While there was never any official documentation describing where these creatures came from, it was evident that they were a product of the forest, having been created when roots from the trees, which contained the shape-shifting white substance, came into contact with unique cadavers in the wood. For instance, in the case of the swampers, there was a corpse in a swampy area which had lizards stuffed down its throat. This corpse was also wrapped in roots from the trees, meaning the white substance would have come in contact with it, which led to the creation of the swampers. An interesting finding with regards to these corpses was that they seemed to be deliberately staged for the forest to find and replicate, as it was evident that the items that were in the corpses were placed, albeit violently, within them. And the bodies were always conveniently close enough to the trees and roots that replication by the white substance could take place. Evidently, something in the forest wanted these monstrosities to be created, but whether for defense against outsiders or some other purpose was never uncovered by the government. Not every replica created by the forest was a dangerous monster, however, as there were reports of other strange creatures in the wood that weren't as hostile as those previously mentioned. Some were actually capable of holding conversations with the researchers. These friendly, or at least non-aggressive replicas, suggested that if something was working to get these replicas created, they didn't have full control over what things were replicated, and that the forest, or at least the white substance, acted independent of their actions. These friendlier replicas were few and far between though, and for the most part, the government workers had to deal with the monstrous replicas of the Darkwood when doing their work. What made that work even more dangerous was the fact that all of the dangers of the forest, from the savages to the monsters and particularly the miasma, were much more active at night, requiring the researchers to bunker down in their hideouts when the sun went down. It wasn't uncommon for the researchers to be besieged by hostile visitors during this time. Visitors they had to fight off, lest they wanted to be killed by them. During these nighttime incursions, they could never wander too far from their hideouts, as if they did, they would be attacked by the most dangerous foe in the wood, a strange mass of red tendrils named the Floor Gore. Appearing only at night, these tendrils of red flesh would quickly swarm over their victims, damaging them until they consumed them whole. And unlike all the other creatures and entities of the Darkwood, the floor gore could not be stopped by barricades or obstacles or weapons, meaning once it set its sights on a victim, their doom was inevitable. However, the government was able to find a defense against this terrifying entity, a weird unnamed substance that let out a gas or scent when cooked that, for whatever reason, repelled the floor gore making it give up its chase. Thus, in every government hideout, there was an oven installed that cooked the substance and piped its vapors all throughout the structure, thereby giving the researchers a little bubble of safety that they could use to get through the night. This protective substance also seemed to give an added benefit of protecting the researchers from the Darkwood's infectious miasma, as it was mentioned that the local villagers who were sick with the forest's plague did not need to breathe this substance, likely because the gas would no longer be of use to them since they were already sick with the disease. Interestingly, those same villagers were also never attacked by the floor gore. It was only the government researchers, or people from outside the forest, that were the targets of the tendrils. In fact, it seemed that the outsiders were always the main focus of the hazards of the wood, as if the forest itself recognized they were foreign bodies and wanted to expel them. Despite these challenges, the government had been able to overcome all the hurdles sent their way, allowing them to continue their research. But, ultimately, they met their defeat at the hands of the biggest weapon that the Darkwood had, its replicated trees. Ever since the government started its research into the forest, its trees have been a problem due to how insatiably they grew, 
they constantly encroached on their positions and steadily pushed them out of the wood throughout the years. Eventually, the trees consumed the road into and out of the region, essentially becoming the blockade set up by the government, but with the added effect of also blocking the government from entering the wood. Not willing to give up their work, the government worked around this issue by digging long, intricate tunnels underneath the trees that would get them the access they needed. Of course, this opened up a path to the outside, so in addition to keeping the local populace ignorant of the existence of these tunnels, they were barricaded so that the people and monsters of the Darkwood couldn't use them to escape. These barricades took the form of heavy metal doors that were locked when not in use, and when an expedition was sent into the forest, each member had a key that could be used to get through the doors. This workaround worked for a time, allowing research to continue, but as the years wore on, even these tunnels were destroyed by the forest, whose large braided roots caused collapses as they grew over or through the tunnels. Additionally, the tunnels somehow seemed to draw the ire of the crazed savages of the wood, who seemed to have an uncanny ability to sniff out where the hideouts with tunnel entrances were and attacked them. While most of these savages were fended off, some were able to penetrate the tunnels, requiring them to be killed before they can be used again. Any one of these issues, from the deadly plague, to the crazed locals, the nightmarish monsters, or the trees that grew faster than weeds, would be a lot to deal with on their own. But the Darkwood had all of them at once, and eventually, due to all of these issues, journeys into the forest, especially its inner reaches where activity was highest, slowed to the point that, by 1987, 12 years after the impact events that set everything in motion, only a handful of expeditions were launched a year. They did still happen though, and in September of 1987, one such expedition was organized. But unlike most of the other expeditions of late, this one would send the researchers through Tunnel 21 so they could reach the furthest depths of the forest. The mission was described as urgent, with its ultimate goal being to gather further information on the forest's roots and gather information on the white substance that ran through them. Everything seemed to be going according to plan until the expedition was attacked by a large group of savages. The lunatics overwhelmed the outsiders, killing them and tying some of their mangled corpses to trees near their camp. However, not every outsider was killed in the attack. One of the men, the protagonist of our story, who was a grizzled veteran of the forest that had survived five previous journeys into it, survived and broke free from his bonds. He stumbled into some farmlands where he traded his hazmat suit for the clothes from a scarecrow. Remembering his small apartment, where his significant other and his dog were waiting for him to come home, the protagonist then took off into the forest, desperately trying to make his way back to the underground entrance to return home. He didn't make it though, eventually collapsing in a clearing, seemingly doomed to die in the dark wood. But at that moment, he was found by a local doctor. It wasn't exactly the salvation the protagonist hoped for, however, as this doctor, who had toiled for years trying and failing to save the people of the Darkwood, was sick of being trapped in the forest, and wanted to escape from it to be reunited with his wife and daughter, who had been evacuated from the forest years ago. Upon seeing the protagonist's key, the doctor realized he was an outsider and would know the paths out of the Darkwood, so he brought the protagonist back to his home and tied him to a chair. The doctor drugged and beat his prisoner, trying desperately to get information out of him, but the outsider never gave up the location of the underground passage. The doctor walked off frustrated, whereupon the protagonist broke free from his restraints and escaped his room. He caught a glimpse of the doctor as he did, but the power went out, plunging the cabin into darkness. As the protagonist stumbled around in the dark, he heard someone call for help from behind a door locked with a code, another prisoner of the doctor. As the protagonist searched for a way to help the prisoner, he came upon a terrifying sight. A hallucination of a corpse with dials instead of eyes lying on the ground where a radio just was. Then the body spoke, telling the protagonist to turn on the generator. And after he acquiesced, it gave him the code to the locked door, thereby allowing him to release the prisoner. As a reward for doing so, the protagonist was attacked. After fighting off his attacker and collecting a plastic chick from his body, the cabin was then beset upon by monsters that looked like black versions of the chompers that lived in the woods, who knocked the protagonist out as they swarmed through the cabin. As he lay in a daze, he saw a figure emerge from the fog of his vision, reaching out a hand as if to help. 
and the next thing he knew, he was coming to on the floor of one of the government hideouts. After taking a moment to recall the events of the previous night, he found that his key to Tunnel 21, his only means of getting home, was missing, now in the hands of that doctor. He found pages torn out of his journal as well, and worried that the doctor may have found the underground entrance, he rushed off to see if it had been opened. He breathed a sigh of relief when he found that the door had not been used in the past couple weeks. Curiously, when he investigated the door, he noticed a bead of light when he looked through the keyhole. He didn't think much of it, believing it to be one of the lights in the tunnel beyond, so returned to the hideout where he resolved to find the doctor and recover his key where he could then escape the forest and get home. He got his first lead the morning after his first night in the forest when he found he had a visitor in his hideout, a stranger with a large coat standing by the oven. Poking out of the stranger's hood was the face of a wolf, and when the stranger spoke, it became clear that the wolf face wasn't a mask, it was the man's actual face. Despite his gruff greeting, the wolfman said he would help the protagonist find the doctor if he helped him with the job first. The protagonist agreed, but the wolfman wanted to prove that he was capable of doing the job first by meeting him in his camp in the silent forest, which, according to the wolfman, was going to be dangerous to get to. Eager to get started, the protagonist then set out to gather materials from the dry meadow around him to prepare for the journey. The wolfman wasn't the only visitor he got, as the next morning, the protagonist found another stranger in his hideout. And as he approached his second visitor, he saw that it was the man that rescued him from the doctor's house. Without the fog of unconsciousness clouding his vision, he could see his rescuer seemed to be an outsider like he was, as he was wearing the standard hazmat suit outsiders wore when coming to the forest. Upon closer inspection, though, the protagonist noticed some peculiarities about this visitor. His skin was unnaturally pale, and there were growths along the front of his helmet, a helmet that looked less like something he wore, and looked more like something that was a part of him. He even thought the visitor looked familiar, but it was hard to tell for certain through the fogged up viewfinder. If the man was an outsider, he was evidently trapped here like the protagonist was, and he didn't talk about trying to escape. In fact, when asked about the road home, he merely told the protagonist that it was useless to try to escape as all roads led deeper into the forest. Although the man spoke, his speech was muffled by his helmet, which he refused to take off. Instead, he communicated by writing messages on his gloves or skin. This was likely due to the training of the outsiders, but it didn't help quell the suspicions the protagonist had about his helmet. Despite his peculiarities though, the visitor indicated that he wanted to help the protagonist, offering to trade with him. It wasn't a one-time offer either, as the trader showed up every morning with a renewed stock in order to help the protagonist with his journey. Buoyed by the friendly trader, the protagonist spent the next several days gathering supplies in the dry meadow around him while defending himself from the creatures of the Darkwood. As he did so, he noticed he no longer had a want for water or food. Well, except for a strong desire to eat the red mushrooms that bloomed in the forest, a craving he soon gave into. But after cooking and eating some of these mushrooms, he found that they gave him terrifying nightmares. In one, he dreamed of a talking cadaver that tried to convince him to take a nap in a grave. If he refused its offer, he was attacked by another one of those black chompers, ending the nightmare. In another, he was in a church that served as a triage center the local populace set up to deal with the infection. Sick people lied on church pews and others waited in a line to get to the church's basement, presumably to be quarantined. Upon inspecting a room on the side of the building, the protagonist found a strange box, and upon picking it up, a black chomper appeared and attacked. But this one screamed about a seesaw, and a dress, and a box for his girls. If the protagonist was killed in or fled from the ensuing fight, his nightmare ended. But if he overcame the chomper, then he would find a medallion on its corpse that held a picture of two girls with haunting, twisted faces, and a code which could be used on the trap door of the church, which, when used, also ended the nightmare. Weirdly, what happened in this dream actually had an effect in the real world. First of all, the strange box that the protagonist had found in his dream was on his person. 
and the Wolfman, who appeared in the protagonist's hideout once again, said that he would be able to open it once the protagonist brought him its key from a location in an area of the forest called the Old Woods. That location was the same church of the protagonist's nightmare, and what he found in its ruins depended on the outcome of his dream. If he had successfully killed the chomper, then he would find the corpse of a man split in half lying where the chomper died. However, if he was killed by or fled from it, then a man would be sitting in the church, muttering about things he would get for his girls, just like the chomper did in the protagonist's dream. Interestingly, if this man was killed, a medallion like the one that was found on the black chomper could be found on his body, complete with the code to the basement, but without the faces of the girls being distorted. All things considered, the implication was clear. This man was the black chomper the protagonist had seen in his dream, and further suggested that some things he saw in those dreams were real. Either by using the code from the medallion or being given it by the man in the church, the protagonist unlocked and descended down into the basement steps, which was filled with plague-ridden corpses and either people on the verge of becoming chompers if he was killed by or fled from the chomper in his dream, or huge dogs if he killed the chomper. In the deepest part of the basement, the protagonist found the key the wolfman was talking about, and upon delivering it to him, the wolf excitedly opened the box, but was angry to find that all it held was a shiny stone and some child's drawings. Upon investigating the drawings, the protagonist noticed they told a story. In a house in the forest lived a man with his two daughters and his dog. After the meteor impact and the appearance of the strange mushrooms in the forest, the family's dog ate one of the mushrooms and apparently died as a result. Afterward, perhaps to cheer them up, the father took down the doghouse and used the wood to build a red seesaw for his girls, all things that are mentioned by the chomper or the man in the church, indicating he was the father depicted in the story. This happy moment wasn't to last, however, as their house was then burned down by the government in the effort to control the plague the remains of which the protagonist could find in the dry meadow of the forest. In an effort to keep them safe from the chaos engulfing their home, the father sent his girls to the quarantine zone of the church basement. But it was all for naught, as the girls, wrapped in each other's arms, watched the bodies pile up around them as the plague claimed the lives of those in the basement. Back on the surface, their father, separated from his girls by the trees of the forest and by the locked basement door, lost his mind as the plague consumed him. Back to the protagonist's nightmares, a third had him back at home in his house, safe and content. That is, before a knock on the door and a visit of his current self shattered the illusion. Interestingly, the protagonist could be woken up from this dream in a different way. If he sneaked around his dream self, he could come to a hidden corridor full of shiny stones, chairs, and twinkling lights. In its dark depths, he could find a TV that told him he should not be there, and would wake him from the dream. The last nightmare was perhaps the most unsettling. He was in Tunnel 21 when a voice called to him, guiding him along a trail of shiny stones that led to a lamp. When the protagonist flipped the light on, it revealed a huge pile of bodies lying all around it. The lamplight soon dimmed to reveal a cradled up child lying in the center of the bodies. Not far from the child and the bodies was a bed, which the protagonist climbed inside of and fell asleep in, which brought him back to the real world. These nightmares were not the only side effect of the mushrooms, however, as by consuming their essence, the protagonist was empowered, gaining skills to use as he worked to survive in the forest. Thus, he always kept an eye out for these mushrooms, as well as other items that could give him the same kind of hallucinogenic effect as he explored the forest. Eventually, after gathering the necessary supplies, the protagonist successfully made his way to the silent forest. At one point along the way, he passed by an emaciated figure sleeping on the ground. After inspecting the body, he started to walk away when the figure spoke to him, telling him to look for an exit in the floor of the last hideout. Not understanding him, the protagonist left the sleeper to his ramblings and continued on, where he found the wolfman in his camp. 
Realizing now that the protagonist would be able to help him, the wolfman told him about a chicken lady that lived in a local village who kept something he greatly desired locked in a room in her house. The protagonist's job was to get the key to that room and bring it to him. Upon its delivery, the wolfman would tell him where he could find the doctor. Before he sent him on his way, the wolfman asked for one more favor from the protagonist as the squealing of pigs echoed through the forest. He asked him to silence that squealing in exchange for a reward. The deal struck, the protagonist made his way out into the silent forest to find the village, and while exploring it, came across a building where, after killing a dog that had taken refuge in a garage, he met a young man named Piotrek. Piotrek was fascinated with space, idolizing the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin and admiring the stars. He didn't only want to see the stars from the ground though, he wanted to build a rocket to launch into space, the progress of which the protagonist could see in a little clearing outside of his shop. He could also help Piotrek accomplish this by bringing him materials from broken down tractors spread around the forest. If, while gathering the materials, the protagonist showed one of them to the wolfman, the wolf would ask to see it and then sabotage it so that it became a bomb. If the protagonist was feeling cruel, he could hand the sabotaged part over to Piotrek, who would be none the wiser about the danger of the part and use it in the construction of his rocket. In any case, once enough parts were brought to him, Piotrek would reward the protagonist and then set to work to complete his rocket and launch into space. But if he was given a sabotaged part, he wouldn't live to see that dream being killed in a fiery explosion that occurred when he tried to start his rocket. Regardless of the fate of Piotrek, the protagonist continued exploring the forest, eventually finding the village mentioned by the wolfman, where he was not greeted warmly by the populace. They avoided his gaze and ignored him as much as possible. As he wandered the streets, he passed by the embers of a bonfire that held a medical bag in it. Nearby, a man mumbled a contemptuous remark about the doctor. With this, the protagonist realized it hadn't been monsters that attacked the doctor's house that night. It was the villagers who were lashing out at the doctor for his failure to cure those infected with the plague. It also explained how he made it out alive as he was either missed or spared by the villagers, a kindness that would not have been extended to him had it been monsters of the dark wood that attacked. He learned something else as he wandered the streets too. After being cut off from the wider world, these people had been able to survive by eating the offspring of their village sow. The abundance of pigs in the village was what was making the squealing sound the wolfman was complaining about. However, the people were now facing a famine because they were unable to feed the pig, meaning she couldn't produce any more offspring. The difficulty in feeding her came from the fact that she had been mutated by the plague of the darkwood, giving her a gargantuan size and a violent temper. While her size rendered her immobile, feeding her was dangerous because she wildly bit at anyone that came close to her due to her insatiable want for flesh, an appetite that could have been developed by the pig farmer's choice of meat for her, flesh from human cadavers. The populace had been able to work around her regression by stunning her with an electric shock from a nearby generator, but the cables of the machine had recently been cut by a malfactor, rendering the machine unusable. The pig farmer, who had an unhealthy fascination with the sow, had tried to feed her without stunning her, and had been killed by the beast in the process. After his death, no one else was willing to take the risk of feeding the sow, meaning that unless someone fixed those cables, everyone in the village was going to starve. Well, everyone except for one man who had a stash of meat hidden in his home, meat that likely came from human cadavers, Considering the prevalence of bodies hidden in the back of his home, the bloody meat grinder hidden in a locked wardrobe, and his insistence on secrecy when his stash was found. While most of the populace wanted the sow to provide them food again, there was one person that didn't. Sitting in the remains of a burned house sat a woman who told the protagonist to kill the pig when he passed her by. The desire of this woman named Hanuska to see the sow's death and the inevitable downfall of the village stemmed from something the other villagers did to her in the past. Hanuska used to live in the village with her husband, and the two welcomed a child into the world. But due to the plague, the baby was incredibly deformed. 
so much so that even the dogs of the village yelped in horror at it. Fearing the monstrosity, the villagers took it from Hanuska and disposed of it. They also burned down the house where she and her husband lived, an event that claimed her husband's life. Seeing the ones she loved be killed by the villagers caused contempt to grow in her heart, to the point that she wanted to see the end of the village. In fact, if Hanuska is killed, a knife and a cable can be found on her person, indicating she was the one that sabotaged the Sao's stunning machine. That sabotage wasn't enough though. She wanted someone to take it a step further and kill the Sao. If the protagonist took pity on those in the village, he could help them by getting a cable either from Hanuska's body or from Piotrek and repair the machine, thereby giving the villagers the means to get out of their plight. However, if he chose to fulfill the wishes of the wolfman and Hanuska, he had a couple of ways of killing the Sao. He could destroy her through conventional means, though this was dangerous as attacking the Sao would cause the other pigs that inhabited the shed to come to her defense, and attacking the Sao with melee weapons put the protagonist in range of being attacked himself. This was before considering her constitution, which meant killing her this way would take a lot of time and resources. The other method he could use followed the same path as the one he'd take if he chose to save her, but after repairing the machine, he could increase its power and then send a lethal jolt of electricity to the sow, frying her from a distance. No matter the method, if the protagonist chose to kill the sow, there were a number of repercussions from his actions. Upon returning to the village, he would be invited to speak with its leader in his home, and once he entered the basement, a chomper the leader kept down there to assert his dominance would be unleashed on him as revenge for killing the sow. In the village proper, the corpse of the sow would be set in the center of a ceremonious circle with people all over mourning her loss. And lastly, the villagers, pushed to desperation after losing the creature that they relied on for sustenance, began trying to chop their way through the trees of the darkwood, hoping to find a new source of food in another region of the forest. While the plight of the villagers was one that filled most people with sorrow and sympathy, one person took delight in the misery of the villagers. The wolfman who told the protagonist he would sleep soundly with the crying of the villagers in his ears. On the outer edge of the village, the protagonist found the home of the chicken lady the wolfman mentioned, as well as the locked door in the back of her house. When talking with the woman though, he didn't learn what was in the room nor where its key was. The only thing he did learn came after he showed her the plastic chick he recovered from the other prisoner of the doctor. Apparently, the man, named Yannick, was her brother and had run off to confront the doctor a number of days ago. She, evidently, hadn't learned what became of him, and the protagonist, perhaps out of shame, didn't bother to clue her in. At that moment, a horrible screeching sound came from outside. When the protagonist went to investigate, he found it came from a shoddy violin played by a boy horribly mutated by the plague. From talking with this musician, the protagonist learned what the chicken lady kept locked in her room. It was her sister, the pretty lady, who, like the boy, had been horribly mutated by the plague and now had to be tied down and locked away to prevent her from eating people. However, the musician was unaware of her cannibalistic behavior and was trying to woo her by playing his violin outside her window. Then he gave the protagonist a clue on how to get the key to her room, saying that Yannick used to have a key himself. The two of them used to play by the village well, so the musician suggested the protagonist check around it to see if he could find any clues. The protagonist found the well was dried up and in disrepair, so used a chain to fix it and descended into its depths to find a tunnel system that ran under the village. As he walked through the tunnel, he was soon attacked by a chomper. Interestingly, he noticed this chomper was the size of a child, and after killing it, found it held a small doll, a burned copy of which could be found in the charred remains of Hanuska's home. The implication was clear. After the villagers took away her deformed baby, they threw it down the well, where it eventually became this chomper. Continuing on, the protagonist eventually found that the tunnels ran straight to Yannick's home, and in the remains of the building, he found a key covered in chicken feces, the key sought by the wolfman. Upon delivering it to him, the ecstatic wolfman gave the protagonist the location of a train wreck in the old woods, another region of the forest that was close by, 
saying that the doctor locked himself within it after being attacked by the villagers, and he wasn't opening the doors for anyone. Despite the protagonist saying the deal wasn't fulfilled, the wolfman disappeared, but not before telling the protagonist he could find him in a barn in the old woods. Having no other leads, the protagonist made his way to the barn to meet his canine-faced companion, and as he was making his way through the old woods, he stopped by a curious cabin he noticed amongst the trees. Upon investigating the inside, he found it was full of stuffed animals, trophies of successful hunts of the beasts. In a back room, he found the corpse of a hunter. Interestingly, the body was now covered in tree roots, which meant the white substance would have come in contact with it, and may have created a replica of this hunter. As the protagonist was mulling this over, he realized that this corpse and cabin may have been where the wolfman had come from, having been created when the roots touched the hunter's body along with one of his trophies and merged them together into a new living entity. Further implying this connection was the fact that on the body of the deceased hunter was a wedding ring, a replica of which could be found on the body of the wolfman should he be killed. Another wedding ring could also be found in the chicken lady's house, in bedding in the room with the pretty lady that was implied to be where the chicken lady slept, perhaps explaining why the wolfman was so keen on getting into the room. In any case, the protagonist continued on and made it to the barn of the wolfman where he found the wolf with blood smeared all over his face, the result of eating the pretty lady, whose half-eaten corpse lay in a room just behind him. Unlike all their previous conversations, the protagonist found the wolfman was in an incredibly good mood thanks to his meal, and as thanks for the gift, offered to take the protagonist to the doctor's old home, believing it could give him a clue on how to get to the doctor. The protagonist agreed, and as he explored the macabre buildings of the medicine man's old home, he found a locked safe under the rug in the central room. After deducing its code, he found a notepad inside that revealed the code to the locked door of the train wreck. Finally having what he needed to face the doctor, the protagonist took off towards the train wreck and opened its locked door, coming face to face with the man that stole his key. The doctor spiraled into crazy pleading as the protagonist approached, explaining how he had been brought to the edge by the unfairness of watching the outsiders freely come and go while he was trapped here caring for villagers sick with a never before seen illness while he heard his daughter call to him, asking him to come to her. Hearing how the doctor had been mentally tormented through the years could make the protagonist sympathize with him and give him what he sought, the location of the underground entrance. As thanks for the protagonist's generosity, the doctor said he would wait for him there so the two could go through the door together. However, the protagonist could just as easily take no pity on the doctor and kill him, taking his key back by force. Giving the key covered in chicken feces to the wolfman wasn't the only way that the protagonist could find the doctor. When he learned of the existence of the key from the musician, the boy asked for the key himself so that he could use it to finally meet his future wife, the pretty lady. If the protagonist gave him the key instead, the boy would be extremely gracious, but asked for another favor from him. Lacking the courage to approach the pretty lady with such a shoddy violin, he asked the protagonist to go to his parents' house in the old woods to get his mom's nice violin. He explained that he couldn't go himself because his parents no longer acknowledged him because they were upset with him for some reason. He handed the protagonist a drawing, saying to give it to his mother as an apology, hoping that once she saw the drawing, she would forgive the musician and would let him borrow her nice violin. In exchange, the musician said he would get the protagonist an appointment with the doctor. The musician was one of the few people left that could get in contact with the doctor due to the boy still trusting in him and seeing him as a kind man, feelings that emerged after the doctor had treated him with kindness and care. He was actually the one that gave the musician his wooden mask, carving it from a doll he owned and gifting it to him so he could be healed of his afflictions. The protagonist obviously jumped on this lead and headed to the old woods as the boy requested. When he found the home of the musician's parents, he found them inside lying half dead on the ground, both on the verge of mutating into chompers. If he made any wrong moves, they would come to life and rip him to shreds, requiring him to fight them off 
However, if the protagonist followed the musician's instructions and gave his mother his drawing, the gesture would pacify his parents, allowing the protagonist to safely collect the violin. Upon delivering the instrument to the musician, the boy would make good on his promise, telling the protagonist about the appointment he booked with the doctor and where he could find him. The delivery of the violin also gave the musician the belief that his parents had forgiven him. Excited about the possibility of reuniting with them, he returned to his home, and what happened next depended on how the protagonist dealt with his parents. If he killed them, then the musician would be found standing over the fresh graves of his parents, lamenting the protagonist's actions through choked back tears. But if he spared them, either by fleeing from them after they mutated, or by pacifying them with the musician's drawing, then upon his return to his home, the musician would be greeted with the terrible maws of his mutated parents, who tore him apart after morphing into chompers. If the protagonist chose this path, then when he visited the doctor at the train wreck, he would be ambushed by the doctor, who, having been made aware of the protagonist's arrival by the musician, flooded the train cars with gas, knocking the protagonist out. The doctor again drugged and interrogated his prisoner, hoping to get the location of the underground entrance out of him. This time, the drugs put the protagonist to sleep, where he started dreaming, and in his dreams, he saw the memories of the doctor of the times he visited the pretty lady, being unable to help her as she mutated into her grotesque form, of the turning sentiments of the villagers as he failed to cure their infections. Then he had an out-of-body experience, seeing himself being interrogated by the doctor, but unable to intervene with the situation. As he explored his environment, he was once again attacked by black chompers. If he managed to escape the monsters, then he would resist the influence of the drugs and overpower the doctor, where he would once again be presented with the choice of showing him the location of the underground entrance or killing him and taking back his key by force. However, if the protagonist was killed by the black chompers during his nightmare, then he didn't get that choice, as the doctor was finally able to pry the location of the underground entrance from him during the interrogation. The protagonist then lost consciousness, waking up alone a few hours later. Despite fearing the worst, when he made his way to the underground entrance, he found that the doctor left the door open and had also left signs telling the villagers to go through the door to reach freedom themselves. Despite their animosity towards him and his own resentment towards them, he couldn't help but to try and help them. While helping the wolfman or the musician were the most obvious paths for the protagonist to take to meet the doctor, they weren't the only ones. He could also avoid doing all those favors for the two by killing the chicken lady. If he did so, he would find some instructions on her body that would lead him straight to the doctor's house, where he would then walk down the path that would lead to his confrontation with the doctor and the opening of the door of the underground entrance. No matter what path he took, the protagonist walked out of the train wreck with his path home open to him. But before he made his way through the door, he met his friend the traitor one last time, who again tried to persuade him to give up trying to take the road home, asking him to stay here with him. During this encounter, the traitor pulled the protagonist close to him, and during this interaction, the protagonist got a glimpse down the traitor's shirt, where he noticed that his initial thought about his helmet turned out to be true. It was fused with his body. This, combined with his pale skin and the scent of mushrooms on his person, finally confirmed a suspicion the protagonist had had since he'd met the traitor. He was a replica of the forest. And given how familiar he seemed, the protagonist realized it was possible that the traitor may have been a replica of someone he knew. If that was the case, the traitor didn't say anything about it, and his pleas for the protagonist to stay fell on deaf ears as the protagonist turned his back on the traitor and headed to the underground entrance to make his way home. Once the door was opened, the protagonist made his way through it until his path forward was blocked by roots in the trees. He noticed someone lying in the rubble, and it was evident that the figure was a replica of the forest, as he was attached to the roots. The man began mumbling about a talking tree that blocked the road home, but then reached into his own head and pulled out a replica of the bullet that killed him, an action that caused the death of his replicated form. Turning his back on the figure, the protagonist went on, emerging in another government hideout. 
this time in a swampy area of the Darkwood. As he familiarized himself with his surroundings, he eventually found what the replicated man in the tunnel was talking about, as beyond the remains of a village was a gigantic tree blocking the road home. This wasn't a normal tree though, as in its trunks were several people who were all arguing and fighting, creating a noise that was so cacophonous it was impossible to make out what any one figure was saying. Having no other option, the protagonist turned his back on the tree and started scrounging the village for resources. As he did so, he found that someone still lived in the village, although it wasn't by choice as the man was handicapped and didn't have the means to leave what used to be his home. By talking with the cripple, listening to his ramblings after showing him items, and through a nightmare he had at one point, the protagonist pieced together the story of where the tree came from, which was inextricably linked with the downfall of the village. As the dark wood closed in around the village, the whole area around it was flooded, preventing the people from farming the land. To buy themselves time before they starved, the people agreed to ration their food and distribute it equally among themselves so they could all survive through the tough times facing them. However, one man, who had been left to care for his three eldest sons after his wife left the village with her four youngest, felt he wasn't getting his fair share of rations. So he gathered together a group of like-minded individuals and raided the food stores of the village, barricading the entrance to the cellar to prevent the others from stopping them. Once they ate all the food, the raiders tried to tunnel their way out of the cellar, but died before they could make their escape. Meanwhile, above ground, without the ability to reach their food, the rest of the villagers all starved to death. As time passed, the roots of the forest grew into the abandoned houses in the tunnel of the cellar, coming into contact with the various bodies of the villagers, eventually leading to the creation of the Talking Tree, a conglomeration of the villagers who still bickered about the robbery of the food. Their tireless arguments had driven the cripple crazy, and he asked the protagonist if he could get him some much needed silence by destroying the tree. He suggested he head to the basement of one of his former neighbors where he could get at the tree's roots, which would be easier to destroy. Needing to get past the tree himself, the protagonist went along with the cripple's suggestion, but found that the basement of the home in question was flooded. Upon hearing this, the cripple had the idea that the protagonist could dive under the water to get to the passage that had the tree roots, and suggested he head to the elephants to ask them for one of their oxygen tanks. They didn't live in the village though, they lived out in the forest, so the protagonist was going to have to travel through the trees to get to them. His new path set before him, the protagonist prepared to complete the next leg of his journey. As he spent the next few days gathering resources and supplies to make it to the elephants, he began to familiarize himself with his new surroundings. One morning, after staying a few days in the swamp, he noticed a corpse laying outside of his hideout. Taking a look at it, he noticed the man had been decapitated, but upon closer inspection, noticed that the helmet looked to be a part of the man's body. Indeed, these were the remains of his old friend, the traitor, who had been killed by an unknown assailant, someone evidently upset with him as the word liar had been scratched upon his viewfinder. Interestingly, on the traitor's body was a replica of the key to Tunnel 21, indicating that the traitor was not only a replica of an outsider, but may have been one of the researchers of the expedition that the protagonist had been a part of, or maybe even a replica of the protagonist himself having been created when one of their bodies came in contact with the trees and they were tied up by the savages. Whatever the case, the protagonist didn't seem to mourn the traitor's death, making no note about his fate outside of the cursory observations of his body. In fact, his friend had already been replaced as, just like in the previous area, the morning after the protagonist's first night in the swamp, he received visitors. Three mute figures who, despite appearing to be savages, wanted to trade with him. As he traded with the three, he couldn't help but be reminded of something the cripple had mentioned before when he was telling the story of the village, how the three boys of the thief hadn't escaped being punished for their father's sins. They weren't outright executed by the villagers, but they were thrown out of the village, left to an unknown fate. Apparently, the boys had been able to survive the dangers of the Darkwood and still wandered under its leaves. They even seemed to return to the village that used to be their home, as sometimes at night, the cripple would hear the jangle of their cowbell. 
The reason of their return was likely so they could visit the talking tree, which contained the remains of their father. In addition to meeting the three and finding the corpse of the traitor, the protagonist also found an old note in his hideout from a previous government expedition that mentioned a cottage near the junkyard that someone may be living in. During his travels through the region, he made his way to the cottage and met a strange sight. All along the hills leading to the building were large replicas of snails that spoke to him. When he reached the building proper, he found a gigantic snail which immediately withdrew into his shell. Breaking open a portion of it, the protagonist met with the entity and found he had human-like features, suggesting he, like the previous snails, was a replica of the forest. The snail was apparently unaware of his own transformation, as he insulted his visitor on his appearance, not understanding that he actually looked worse than him. The snail was also under the effect of the plague, as he mentioned hearing a voice call to him, and asked the protagonist to set him free so that he could make his way to it, which the protagonist could do by finding and destroying some growths in a clearing not far from the cottage. Just as the snail promised, the next day, he was gone, and with his massive form removed, the rest of the cottage could be investigated. In this section of the building was the corpse of a man covered in roots lying on a bed. When reading a note by the man's body, the protagonist learned that the man had apparently eaten snails before he died, hinting that the roots of the trees came in contact with his body and the snails of his stomach to create the snail entity. The man was also apparently fascinated with a voice he kept hearing in his radio, a voice that the protagonist himself also heard at one point hinting at where the snail went after he was freed from his cottage. In addition to these encounters, the protagonist also began to see the ramifications of some of the choices he'd made before traveling through the tunnel. If he did not choose to help the wolfman, either by giving the key to the musician or by killing the pretty lady, then one day, when he returned to his hideout, he would find a number of his items missing and a note from the wolf telling him to come to the old sawmill to recover what was stolen. Once there, the wolf told him that he would forgive his transgressions if he could provide him with some entertainment, which involved the protagonist giving up all of his items and then fighting off a pair of dogs and the wolfman himself. If the protagonist came out ahead, killing the dogs and then the wolfman, then he would be able to reclaim his lost things. However, if he was defeated by either of his enemies, then upon his return to the sawmill, he would find another note from the wolf, stating that his items were gone for good but then he left the consolation prize for the protagonist, which was nothing more than a pile of poop. If the protagonist chose to kill the sow, then he would learn that the villagers managed to make it through the wall of trees that bordered the silent forest and come to the swamp, taking up residence in a quarry in the area. Although they had survived the ordeal, they hadn't come out unscathed, as a number of them were now doubled over in pain due to their infection. Additionally, they still faced the problem of starvation, and with the flooded plains of the area, it seemed unlikely they would find much, if anything, in the swamp. But they still held out hope that they would find something that would sate their hunger. If he chose to give the key to the wolfman and chose to kill the sow, then one night, a metal door in his hideout would spontaneously open. When the protagonist went to investigate, he found the musician hiding deep inside. In the time since he'd last seen him, the boy had changed considerably growing to a much larger size due to his illness, barely fitting into the nook he'd wedged himself into. He explained that the villagers had chased him away after cutting through the trees, so he had taken to living here. Due to his size, he couldn't leave, but had sustained himself by snatching rats that got too close to him. He even gifted one of these critters to the protagonist to show his thanks for letting him stay even after the musician's mutation caused him to leak a toxic goo that damaged the protagonist as he stood on it. However, sometimes he couldn't get a hold of a rat and asked the protagonist if he could give him something to eat, a request the protagonist could be happy to comply with. But if he gave the musician any hallucinogens, like the red mushrooms or odd meat, then the boy's mutation would accelerate, causing his size to balloon even further. He would then disappear from the hideout, somehow finding the strength and bravery to pick himself up and wander into the dark wood. If the protagonist didn't follow through with the wolfman's sabotage and helped Piotrek build his rocket, 
then he would hear rumors about a loud explosion that rocked a junkyard in the forest. When he went to investigate these rumors, he found the mangled remains of the rocket, and lying within them was the corpse of Piotrek. The young man had apparently managed to achieve his dream of launching his rocket, but before reaching the stars, he came crashing down to Earth, dying in the resulting crash. Lastly, there were a number of interactions the protagonist could have with the doctor if he lived to make it to the swamp. If the protagonist gave up the entrance to the underground during the doctor's interrogation, then he would find a couple of makeshift camps set up by the doctor, but never see him face to face. That is, until he finally met the doctor at a hidden campsite where he found the man had devolved into a savage. It was a fate he was unable to avoid, as the doctor would fall to this state even if the protagonist spared him and came with him to the swamp. However, in this latter case, the protagonist would see the doctor's degradation with his own eyes, meeting him at several places in the swamp, where he would note the loss of the doctor's mental faculties as he was falling victim to the influence of the plague. After finding the necessary equipment, the protagonist could also find a helicopter wreck that held the remains of government soldiers, as well as someone that had the other half of the doctor's picture, which implied a couple of possibilities. It was possible that the helicopter was sent to rescue the doctor, and one of the soldiers was given the picture so they could identify him, but it was equally as possible that this helicopter crashed while in the process of rescuing his family, meaning the doctor's wife and child never made it out of the forest, a fate that the doctor was totally unaware of. Whether he faced these situations or not, the protagonist stayed focused on his goal and eventually made his way through the swamp to find the home of the elephants, which turned out not to be the exotic animals, but a mother and her two kids that wore gas masks to filter the air they breathed. The tubing of the masks was what gave them their nickname. In speaking with the mother, the protagonist learned that she didn't have two children, but three, one was missing. She said that the boy, Marcinek, had been talking about how his granny would take him mushrooming, running off into the forest to find her. She asked the protagonist to bring him back, and in exchange, she would give him one of their oxygen tanks. By using a crude map drawn by the boy as a guide, the protagonist made his way to the granny's house, which he found was in a glade full of mushrooms. As he looked at the house, he felt it was familiar, and before long, realized why. He had seen it before. The granny's house was an exact replica of one of the houses in the swamp village, having been replicated by the white substance after the tree roots came in contact with it. There were even replicas of the villagers, who were chatting about the thievery of their food stores. Inside the house, the protagonist found the old woman, but was surprised to see that she was made entirely of mushrooms, being a replica herself. The aroma of the mushrooms wafting off of her was incredibly enticing, and the protagonist could give in to his impulse and eat the old woman entirely, finding that she was tasty and satisfying. But if he resisted the urge, then before long, the old woman woke and asked him what he was here for. When he showed her the drawing, she admitted the boy had turned up at her home a few days ago, thinking she was his grandma. What happened next depended on if the protagonist killed the sow or not. If he spared the pig, then the granny would freely let him take the child. But if he killed it, then she would tell him how she saw some of the starving villagers around her home and knew that, in their hunger, they were going to eat her. She asked the protagonist to do something about them, and in return, she would let him take the child. The protagonist then had three choices ahead of him. He could head to the quarry and murder all of the villagers. He could destroy some supports holding up a boulder, which after it fell, would block all of the villagers within the quarry, or he could simply lie to the granny, leading her to believe she was safe from the villagers' hunger. No matter his decision, the woman gave the protagonist a key to a room in her home, where he found Martinek and brought him home. Once the boy was returned to his mother, she kept her promise and gave the protagonist one of their oxygen tanks, giving him what he needed to perform the dive in the village. However, this was not the only way the protagonist could get an oxygen tank, and the other way lied in the hands of the fourth child of the elephant mother. Unfortunately, this child died some time ago, but the mother, perhaps because she couldn't bear to let him go, didn't bury the child or dispose of his body. She stored it in a locked shed close to her home. 
Additionally, she believed he was the one that provided the family with clean air to breathe, telling the children that it was his love that protected them from the toxic air of the dark wood. She also left an oxygen tank with his body, which the protagonist could find after deducing the lock combination from a nursery rhyme sung by the children and unlocking the shed, thereby skipping all the running around that the elephant mother and mushroom granny would send him on. Once the protagonist realized the elephant mother had four children, he was again reminded of the story of the swamp village told to him by the cripple, of the mother that left the village with her four youngest kids, and realized the family of elephants was likely the very same family mentioned in the story. As he thought about how funny it was that they not only survived for so long, but that he managed to meet them, he realized that this woman was also the mother of the three the strange traders that visited him in his hideout every morning. Apparently, the three had tried to visit their mother at some point in the past, as the mother told the protagonist a story of a group of savages led by three strange figures that camped outside their house one night. However, for whatever reason, the three left without meeting their mother, as when the morning came, they were gone, and she hadn't seen them since. As the protagonist thought about how interesting it was that he managed to come into contact with the various pieces of this broken family, his thoughts turned to the mushroom granny that the boy thought was his grandma. Upon remembering the woman's home was a duplicate of a house in the village, he headed there to see if he could find anything more. Using a key from the mushroom granny's house, he unlocked her original home where he found a picture of a family. When he showed this to the cripple and the mushroom granny, he learned that the granny was the mother of the elephant mother, and thus truly was Marchinek's grandmother, as well as the grandmother of the three. When the elephant mother left the village all those years ago, her mother had chased after her, but given how frail the old lady was, she likely didn't make it very far before she died. Evidently, after her death, the forest had replicated her body as well as her home thereby keeping each member of the Swamp Village family alive in some way, somewhere in the Darkwood. No matter how he got the oxygen tank, once it was obtained, the protagonist found it was empty. Luckily, there was a compressor in his hideout that he could use to refill it, but unluckily, the machine was broken. Fixing it wasn't too much trouble as by using a note he found in the hideout as a guide, the protagonist was able to find some old compressor parts in a junkyard which he used to fix the machine. Once he was gassed up, he made his way through the flooded basement in the village, opened a large tank of gasoline which poured down to the roots of the talking tree, and set them ablaze. As the fire climbed to a towering inferno, the protagonist realized that it was going to take all night for the tree to burn away, so returned to his hideout for the night. As he did so, he stopped by the cripple to let him know he was finally going to be rid of the tree, but found the man was unresponsive, completely captivated by the flames. Back at the hideout, the protagonist prepared himself for an ordinary night in the darkwood, but tonight was going to be anything but. At one point, he heard a voice come out of the old radio that was in the building. It asked a simple question, why? Before the protagonist could understand what it was asking, a fire started in the hideout, and from the flames came burning people that chased him down and attempted to kill him. As he defended himself from his attackers, he soon realized who they were. These were the people that had been trapped in the talking tree, set ablaze from his actions, and they were coming to kill him for destroying their arboreal home. Their attack continued through the whole night, only stopping once the sun came up. The protagonist then returned to the village, where he found that, just as he thought, the tree had burned down, opening up the road home and finally giving him a way to escape the dark wood. However, despite what the replicated man in the tunnel told him about the tree, there was actually another way the protagonist could get to the road home, one that didn't require him to burn the tree. When the protagonist first encountered the tree, he noticed that one figure appeared to see him and tried speaking to him while pointing to something in the distance. Due to the chaotic noise all the other figures were making, he couldn't make out what the man was saying, but thought he was saying, radio. Curious, the protagonist headed off in the direction the man pointed in, and before long found what the man was gesturing towards, an old radio tower that the government used to operate in the area. It had since been claimed by the Darkwood, and was now the roosting place of the banshees of the forest. 
If the protagonist had set the snail free before coming here, then he would also find the corpse of the snail in the ruins, picked apart by the banshees who feasted upon his squishy flesh. Upon seeing the tower, the protagonist recognized it and remembered there was a passage to the underground in its cellar. After fighting his way through the treacherous halls, the protagonist found the door he was thinking of, but found it was blocked from the other side. He noticed a lever nearby that was overgrown with mushrooms and felt it was the key to getting through the tunnel. When he destroyed the mushrooms, they released spores that knocked the protagonist out and sent him to a dreamscape. As he wandered in the darkness, following a voice in a trail of shiny stones, he passed by several familiar sights. The tree he was tied up on, the doctor's house, and the tunnels of the underground. Of course, he was also attacked by black chompers. If he was killed by the monsters at any point, then he would wake up from the dream, unable to continue on through the tunnel. But if he was able to dodge them as well as avoid being bitten by a monstrous maw that was part of a tree residing in the tunnel, then he would eventually find rubble blocking a metal door. Upon removing the rubble, the protagonist woke up and found the previously blocked metal door was now open, suggesting that some of his actions in his dreams affected the real world. Upon heading through the door and the tunnel behind it, he found that he was in his old camp, which, if he had initially come from here, suggested he hadn't made his way out of the forest, but deeper within it. However, he had also been confused and disoriented after the savage attack, so didn't put too much thought into what finding his old camp meant, and just focused on finding the way out. He made his way through the ruins and found what he was searching for, the road home. Just as he thought, the underground path had circumvented the talking tree, allowing him to escape the forest. No matter how he got to it, once the protagonist reached the road, he eagerly rushed down its pavement to get home. As he stepped over thick, colorless goo seeping up through the pavement, he soon came upon the replicas of various people frozen in place on the road. If he burned the tree down, he would also find the cripple on the road, dragging himself along it trying to escape the dark wood. The protagonist didn't offer to help the cripple, merely stepping over him and going on his way. After following the road for a few kilometers and taking a terrifying detour through the trees, the protagonist finally reached home. He took a short walk through his hometown, returned to his apartment, and exhausted from his ordeal, collapsed on his bed. As a deep, peaceful sleep took over him, his story, as well as the story of Darkwood, came to an end. Well, not quite. During his trek through his familiar surroundings, the protagonist could experience a few things that were... weird, to say the least. In the basement of his building, in a small pantry, was a radio that, after playing for it a bit, would urge him to go to sleep. In the same dark halls, he could find some of the mushrooms of the forest, and locked in one of the cells close by was a black chomper. After messing with a door on the main floor, the occupant would open it and scream at the protagonist to go away. And before the door shut, he could get a glimpse inside the apartment and see a baby cradled on the ground, reminiscent of the one he saw in his dreams in the forest. And upstairs, he found that if he tried to reach the end of his hallway, it just went on forever, until eventually being overtaken by tree roots. As a result of all of these, when the protagonist stepped into his apartment, he felt like something wasn't quite right, and his uneasiness seemed to be justified when he found roots on the floor of his home. The protagonist grabbed a screwdriver from his kitchen and started tearing up his floorboards, finding roots all over underneath them, in the living room, in the hallway, and in the kitchen. As he made his way into the bedroom, the words of the sleeper that the protagonist saw at the entrance of the silent forest rang in his ears, the one that told him to look for an exit in the floor of the last hideout. Resisting the urge to lie down and go to sleep, the protagonist looked under his bed to find a large hole underneath it. Upon making his way through it, he suddenly found himself waking from a deep sleep. He wasn't in his apartment though, he had been curled up naked on a bundle of tree roots. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness around him, he found he wasn't alone. There was another sleeper next to him, and another, and another all resting in a sleep so deep and blissful they couldn't be woken up, and apparently he'd been one of them. 
As he wandered through the twisted masses of roots, passing several dozen sleepers, he realized he was at the epicenter of the Darkwood, the place from where the whole forest radiated out from, and soon came upon its nucleus, a spherical mass of white gas. He felt a presence of some kind coming from the sphere, and realized it wasn't an inanimate object, but some sort of being. The protagonist placed his hand on the being and tried to communicate with it, to understand what it was and where it came from, but the answers to his questions, if they could be called that, were incomprehensible to him. The only thing he understood was that he longed for sleep, and the warmth exuded by the being provided the perfect conditions to sleep in. At that moment, the disparate pieces of the story came together, and the protagonist saw the whole picture. This being was what crashed in the forest back in 1975, and ever since that day, it had been using its white substance to grow and create the dark wood. The plague of the forest, that strange sickness that made people hallucinate and hear a voice of a loved one calling them to come deeper into the forest, was the power of this being, a power that eventually became so powerful it could conjure up whole realities in the minds of those that had fallen under its influence. For whatever reason, the being was using its power to lure people to it and make them fall asleep, where they would lay until they starved to death. Then another realization hit the protagonist. He too had fallen to the influence of the being, and the whole time he had been trying to escape the Darkwood, he had actually been walking deeper within it, following the call of the being. But somehow, he had been freed from the influence of this entity and knew he had to do something to stop it. Tearing his hand from the sphere, the protagonist wandered a bit more until he found a sleeper named Machik. After recognizing he was an outsider, the protagonist realized he'd read about Machik in a note in the hideout of the old woods. It said he'd fallen to the influence of the woods and left his camp with a number of supplies. While he'd evidently lost most of his other things in his journey, the protagonist noticed Machek still held one in his arms, his flamethrower. Realizing he could use it, the protagonist tore it from Machek's arm and returned to the being. He then torched the entity, setting it, along with the trees of its forest, ablaze. As the inferno spread, the protagonist began to flee, as did the dozens of sleepers who had woken up when the fires were started. However, despite their best efforts, which included the protagonist using the flamethrower to burn a path through the sleepers, they could not outrun the fires and were eventually consumed by the flames. The conflagration lasted for days, and as the dark wood burned away, a number of its inhabitants were killed. But not all of them, as some managed to survive. Outcomes that depended on the actions the protagonist took during his journey through the dark wood. However, whatever the fates of the inhabitants, one outcome was absolute. Once the forest was reduced to ashes, the calls luring people into the forest died away forever. And with those whispers ended, so too ends the story of Darkwood. It's a story that has a lot of messages. It dabbles with themes of government oppression and human fears of an alien invasion, but foremost among them, it's a story of how people react in the face of disaster. When facing a challenge, some people give up and go to sleep, thereby choosing to live in blissful ignorance or choosing to keep things the way they are despite being unhappy with them. Others though choose to fight and try to change their conditions for the better, whether that be by chopping through an impenetrable wall of trees looking for hope on the other side or stopping an alien takeover by burning the alien down. In either case, that resilience to keep on living, to survive, is at the core of Darkwood. It pushes us, tests our limits, so we can see for ourselves what we would do in the face of difficulty. It's also what makes the game resonate with so many of us, and a true masterpiece. Now, believe it or not, I didn't cover everything in the game, but for the most part, this should cover everything for the main story of Darkwood. I hope I explained it all in a way that made sense, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Before I go, I'd like to remind you that all of my content is also available on Spotify, so feel free to listen over there if that's easier for you. Alright, with that, I'm done here. So, until next time, thank you for watching and see you later.